She's a certified sports nutritionist, creator of the Whole30 program, and author of the New York Times bestselling book, It Starts With Food. She's best known for her tough love, impractical footwear, and helping people find food freedom by breaking unhealthy cravings and habits. Let's give her a big round of applause, everybody. Melissa Hartwig. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to make sure to talk nice and loud over the crowd. So the title of my presentation is Stress and Cravings. And that really small print says why you are still drooling over these donuts, even though you haven't eaten a donut since 2011. This presentation began because a woman at one of our seminars asked us, how many Whole30s will I have to do before I lose my sugar cravings for good? And she wanted me to give her an actual answer, as if I could say 7.53... Hashtag science, right? The problem is that she's asking the wrong question. Cravings aren't about food. Cravings are about stress. See, this is how most people think this equation works. Diet leads to cravings. Cravings lead to diet changes. So you crave sugar because you eat sugar. And because you're eating sugar, you crave more sugar. And then it makes you eat more sugar. And back and forth we go. So if you want to attack your cravings, what do you do? You do a program like the Whole30, right? You do an elimination program that gets rid of most of your triggers. No sugar, no processed food, none of the paleo treats. And if you do that, you can attack your cravings by the end of the 30 days. And the thing is, that actually works really well for most people, but not in the way you think it works. See, this is how that equation actually works. Stress leads to cravings. Cravings lead to more stress. Stress leads to more cravings. Now, cravings can change your diet, and they certainly will. But the only way you get from diet to cravings is via stress. Your diet can certainly be stressful. Bad diets affect blood sugar regulation. They affect hormones. They create inflammation in the body. They reduce your micronutrient status, all of which is stressful in the body. But if you don't understand that, if you still think that cravings are about your diet, you're gonna focus on changing your diet all day long. And you're gonna do a whole 30 or a whole 60 or a whole 90, you're gonna get rid of fruit, you're gonna intermittent fast, whatever you need to do to try to eliminate those cravings. But the problem is you are not addressing stress and the major inputs of stress, physical and psychological. Diet is one input, but just a small one. So you're changing your diet as much as you can, but in the meantime, stress is leading to cravings. Cravings are leading to more stress and changing your diet, and eventually your diet slips. And it continues to slip, and it will continue to slip until finally you find yourself standing in front of the refrigerator with an open jar of frosting, eating it with your fingers. That has never happened to me. But I hear it might happen to someone. So let's talk a little bit about stress. Stress is a perceived threat to your physical or social safety. And in the natural world, stressors tend to be brief but intense. So think an encounter with an angry bear. When you encounter stress in the natural world, chemical messengers turn on the stress response. They get you ready to either fight or run away. And then eventually, over the course of the next few hours, different chemical messengers turn off the stress response to get your body back to a more natural, healthy balance. That's how stress works in the natural world, in a natural environment. But today's modern world is not natural. And the stressors we face are certainly not natural. Adrenaline as one example of a positive stress response, will move blood sugar out of the circulating bloodstream into the muscles because your muscles are gonna do the hard work of fighting or fleeing. And another stress hormone, cortisol, is gonna take blood sugar and return it to the bloodstream and suppress that immune response to get you back to balance. So the goal is just homeostasis, to get you back to a good, normal, healthy place. You can't run around all day with your adrenaline pumping. You know, your heart racing, your stomach flipping, your muscles twitching, that's not healthy and normal. So what goes on? must be turned off. In today's modern world, however, our stressors are constant and they're coming from a variety of angles, both physical and psychological. And under chronic stress, the stress response is overdone. So the body constantly perceives stress. And because of that, the stress response is constantly turned on. So it's kind of like you're encountering a bear 17 times a day, and some of your encounters last three or four hours. And that ain't normal. So in today's modern world, these are the kind of stressors that we face. 
Now, to understand what kind of stress we face and where those inputs are coming from, it's important to note two things about stress. The first thing is that perception is reality. If I'm standing up here on this stage thinking to myself, oh my goodness, those people are all laughing at me. They're all thinking I'm doing a terrible job. I don't know what I'm talking about. They hate my dress. Whether it's true or not, I have just created stress for myself. Because when I believe something to be true that is stressful, that is real stress in the brain. The second thing to remember is that psychological stress and physical stress are, are handled almost identically in the body. So encountering an angry bear is pretty much the same thing as hating your job in terms of the stress response. And these are important to note because we have a lot of inputs for stress in today's modern world. Physical causes of stress, you may be aware of some of these. Most people understand that sleep deprivation is very stressful. Maybe you have a chronic illness or an injury, those can be stressful. But what about things like hard training? You know, if you're crossfitting five or six days a week and doing marathon training on Sunday, that's a huge stress input. Food, malnutrition, under eating, inflammation created by the foods you're eating are big stress inputs. And there are other things like allergies, food sensitivities, all of these physical stress inputs are things that many of us face on a daily basis. And we haven't even started talking about the psychological stuff yet. Psychological causes of stress, most people think, okay, well, maybe my job is hard, maybe I have some financial stress, I'm struggling with my relationship right now. But psychological causes of stress also include things like unresolved childhood trauma, guilt, shame, remorse, betrayal, feelings of rejection, social isolation. It's things like uh, abandonment and all of these things. You could probably take this list and add one or two things of your own. These are all emotional inputs of stress. And remember, the body handles physical and psychological stress almost exactly the same way. So encountering a bear and hating your job are pretty much the same thing. What happens when you have chronic activation of the stress response? We are under stress, most of us, all the time, every day, via physical and psychological inputs. And when the brain perceives stress all the time, the stress response is on all the time. So when it comes to cravings, how does that stress response being on all the time impact what's going on with our cravings? Chronic stress changes serotonin levels and dopamine levels. So these are neurotransmitters responsible for wanting and liking certain rewarding things like food. It impacts your body's ability to regulate your blood sugar. It impacts hormones like insulin and leptin, making them less sensitive, less effective at sending their messages in the body. Changes micronutrient status, particularly magnesium. Magnesium is a very important micronutrient in the brain to help the brain convert sugar to energy. And under chronic stress, we see changes to the prefrontal cortex, which is an area of your brain responsible for good judgment, uh, self-regulation, and willpower. So think about chronic stress's effects on the body and on the brain, and think about your cravings. Imagine wanting things more, but liking them less. You want sweet food more, but when you actually eat it, it is not as satisfying. Imagine the body isn't as good as managing energy. And if it's not as good as managing energy, it's going to tell you it needs more energy all the time. And what's the fastest way to get energy? Sugar. Imagine your brain thinking you're too skinny with leptin resistance, telling you, I don't have enough body fat, you need to eat more particularly at night, particularly after dinner. And imagine your brain isn't as good at converting sugar to energy, causing you to need more energy on a regular basis. Finally, imagine your willpower center isn't working as well. You're not as able to self-regulate, you're not as able to exercise good judgment when it comes to some of your cravings and desires. It's no wonder that on a, under chronic stress, we crave sugar. These are all of the effects of chronic stress that impact our cravings, our body's need for energy. So the important takeaway here is that stress, not diet alone, makes you crave. And if you want to attack your cravings, if you want to reduce your cravings, what do we need to do? We need to reduce our stress. Now, most of the time when people say to me, oh, you have to reduce your stress, or you should reduce your stress, or you want to reduce your stress, what kind of tips do they give you? Just relax. 
you should just relax more. Or they tell you to meditate. Or my personal favorite, maybe do some yoga. I love that one, right? Maybe you should do some yoga. If you are under chronic stress, particularly in the throes of stress addiction, which is a very real condition that we very often give ourselves because that stress response feels good, all of these solutions will make you want to punch a kitten. The idea of taking a 15-minute restorative yoga class gives me anxiety. I can't sit still for 15 minutes. I can't meditate. You can't tell me to relax. I don't want to relax. It doesn't feel good to relax. So that approach for stress management doesn't work. What else do we typically do under stress, though? We typically focus on the things we can't control, right? My job stinks, and it's not like I can quit my job. There's nothing I can do about that. My relationship is in trouble right now, but you know, we're in counseling, we're working on it, like that's the best I can do. I'm under financial stress. I'm trying to manage my bills, but that's really difficult. We focus on the things we can't control. So if we're trying to attack our cravings by reducing stress, I want you to focus on the things you can control. And I want you to focus on the big picture things where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. This is what we call the whole nine health equation. So you can kind of think of your health balance like a bank account. The more deposits you make, the things you do that are good for your health, the wealthier you will be. And you always have withdrawals. Withdrawals are stressors. These are things that take away from your bank account. But as long as your deposits exceed your withdrawals, your health balance will be in the positive. And should you have a big life event that comes along, say you have a baby and you're gonna be sleep deprived for several months on end, as long as that bank account balance is high enough, you can withdraw, withdraw, withdraw and still not get into serious trouble. Where we get into trouble is where under chronic stress, we are not making enough deposits, we're making a lot of withdrawals, our bank account is getting lower and lower and lower and eventually our health balance is in the red. And when that happens, we start to see some pretty serious health conditions. So we're gonna take a look at what we can control in terms of the whole nine health equation. And the first one is nutrition. Now, I know you're thinking, but I'm having cravings and it's really hard for me to control my cravings. So how am I gonna clean up my nutrition? The best way I know of to do that is with our Whole30 program. It's a nutritional reset that you do for 30 days and it is designed specifically to change your emotional relationship with food. And I think going on the Whole30 is the best way in just a few weeks' time to manage your cravings via reducing stress. Remember all the ways that diet impacts stress? It is not a small kind of matter to change your diet to improve your stressful condition. So then you say, well, the Whole30 may be stressful. It's, you know, there are some rules and it's a little bit more problematic and you've got to do a lot of thinking and cooking and planning and shopping. How do I know if something like the Whole30 is too stressful for me? So the trick I like to use is asking yourself, what does my life look at, look like on the Whole30 with my current stressors? If you think to yourself, you know what, I've done the Whole30 before, or it looks pretty manageable, I think I could get into the rules and it would be one less thing for me to worry about, and then I could actually tackle the rest of my stress in, in an easier manner, I'd have a little more capacity, then I would say do the Whole30. If you look at yourself without the Whole30 under your current stressors, and you're generally eating pretty healthy, and you're able to use your willpower to resist a lot of those cravings, maybe you don't need something that strict. But if without the Whole30, under your current stressors, you find yourself face first in a box of Krispy Kremes, I'd suggest maybe trying to get back on the plan to give yourself some structure, to give yourself some guidelines, but most importantly, to build some self-efficacy. Doing the Whole30 for 30 days gives you this sense of, I can do this. I have stress, but this is one thing that I can control and I am controlling it and I am nailing it and I feel so good about how well I'm doing with this program that I can take some of my energy and apply it elsewhere. So do the best you can to manage stress via your diet and you will in turn see your cravings reduced. You can also take a look at your sleep. Now, I understand that not everybody can control every aspect of their sleep. You may go to bed at 10 o'clock every night, but you also may lay awake looking at the ceiling for three hours. That doesn't mean, however, that you can't control your sleep environment. Mark Sisson has a really good article about how to manufacture the best night's sleep of your life. 
starts in the morning. So listen, these are the things that you can do to set yourself up for as good a night of sleep as possible. In the a.m., get bright sunshine right in your eyes. No sunglasses, get outside, get a little bit of that sunshine. Eat a good breakfast, particularly a protein-rich breakfast, and maintain, keep your coffee only to the morning. No coffee afternoon because you'd be surprised at how much coffee will mess with sleep later on in the day. In the evening, dim your lights. You know, try, try to mimic what's going on in the natural world. Keep those lights low. No screens before bed. No TV for at least an hour. No iPad, no iPhone, no Kindle, no computer. Don't check work email right before you go to bed. It will only fire you up. So you want to, again, remove yourself and get yourself in a position where you can relax and start to wind down. And finally, no alcohol before bed. I know a lot of people think, man, I'm just going to have one glass of wine and it's going to help me wind down. But alcohol depletes magnesium super fast. And magnesium is something that's also very quickly depleted under chronic stress. Magnesium also, uh, alcohol also messes with sleep in a major way. So you're actually doing yourself far more harm than good when you try to unwind with that glass of wine later at night. Another big area we can control is our exercise. So many of us are doing some kind of high intensity activity like CrossFit, P90X, maybe we're training for some endurance athletics. The problem with exercise is that it is inherently a stressor and that's a good thing, that's how it works. When we exercise, we stress the body to the point where it then adapts and gets stronger and that's fantastic. But if we're in the throes of chronic stress, sometimes we use exercise to give us that stress response, which feels good. And maybe we overdo it, and maybe that becomes the only way we can feel good. If you ask yourself, could I take a week off from the gym and be okay? If the answer is no, if the answer is the only way I can feel good and like be happy and be normal and be calm and focus is if I go to the gym and beat myself up, then you need to take a good hard look at that because that is withdrawing a whole lot from your bank account. You've got three functions here with respect to exercise. You've got intensity, frequency, and volume. So here's how I like to think about it. Under chronic stress, you can go hard, you can go often, you can go long, pick two. And I'm gonna make it really easy for you because I'm gonna take intensity right out of the picture. Under chronic stress, you need to take intensity out of the picture, which means you've still got frequency and volume. You can exercise every single day if you want to, for two or three hours at a time if you want to, as long as it is at a conversational pace, a guilt-inducing pace. So go for a long walk, go for a long bike ride, get on the rower at your gym and row at like a three-minute pace. Keep it long, keep it easy. It's very good for the cardiovascular system and it's very good for the immune system, which under chronic stress is suppressed. So manage your training and you've got now three things, nutrition, sleep, and exercise that you can actually control to go a long way towards managing stress to manage cravings. What else can we do? Get outside. Green spaces are a proven powerful stress reductor. So it's not walking inside on the treadmill, it's walking outside in a park. Get some sunshine, get some green spaces. Socialization, in-person socialization, not Facebook, not texting, is a very powerful mediator of stress. So go to your CrossFit class, get that good social environment, that good socialization, just don't do the same high intensity workout that they do. You can take a multivitamin, so if micronutrient reduction is a big player in stress and your body's ability to convert sugar to energy, then consider a multivitamin and especially a magnesium supplement. You wail through magnesium at a rate 260 times faster under chronic stress than you do under normal circumstances. So consider a magnesium supplement right before bed is a really good way to help you wind down and relax. That could be in the form even of an Epsom salt bath. And then finally, there's this really interesting theory for the women, it's just a theory, that under chronic stress, we crave more sugar right before our menstrual cycle. So to prevent sugar cravings right around the time of PMS, try eating more carbohydrate on purpose for those few days, um, not carbohydrate from frosting. 
So we're talking about good, healthy carbohydrates in the form of starchy vegetables and sweet potato, uh, butternut squash, acorn squash, maybe some fruit, and see if that helps with particular cravings right around that time of the month. So to go back to the original question, how many Whole 30s will I have to do before I lose my sugar cravings? You're actually asking the wrong question. The question is, how much stress will I have to reduce before I lose my sugar cravings for good? And the answer is all, which is not really very feasible. So what we want to do is reduce our stress to reduce our cravings. You do that first by understanding that this is a biological phenomenon. You're not lazy, you're not weak, you are not lacking willpower. This is a normal, natural response to stress, but the stress in today's modern world is not how it is in the, in the natural world, and that stress response is overdone. Eliminate areas of stress where you can. Control the things you can control. Think big picture, nutrition, sleep, exercise, and then look at some of those other factors that you may be able to mediate. And finally, use things like quiet time, relaxation, yoga, meditation, volunteer work as kind of the icing on the cake to help you get back to a good, healthy place and reduce those cravings. You can visit Whole30.com, tag willpower for more articles on how to boost your willpower in time of cravings and more articles on stress and stress addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Does anybody have any questions for her?